Hello, my name is Genius Black. Right now, I am at Portland Media Center, sitting inside the recording booth, AKA a whisper room. This is where I actually record all of the intro sections for the Maine's Black Future podcast. So I set up in this space with my nice condenser microphone and I do my vocals right in this space uh, and tell the story of one of the historic Black main figures that inspire me and I believe will inspire many of you. After I record the introductory historical section, I move over to the podcast recording studio here at Portland Media Center and I can sit down and have a conversation and engagement with one of the Black leaders that's currently influencing Maine and weaving Maine's Black future. Hey everybody, uh, it's Luigi here, it's Friday p.m. I'm here with Genius Black. Yeah. Good to see you, brother. Absolutely. Uh, so, do you, always go, do you also go by Jerry Edwards, too? Yes, my name is Jerry Edwards. I'm named after my granddaddy and my uncle Jerry, but a lot of people call me Genius. Uh, I always tell people, if you call me Jerry or Genius, I won't be like, don't call me that. Either are my name. Either one, either one. So, you were born in Texas, is that correct? Yeah, from yeah. Dallas. Dallas, Texas, okay. Yeah. How'd you like growing up in Dallas? A nice place. For, for me, you know, home is home for a lot of us. I loved it. You know, I played football. I did basketball, track football every year. Ate tons of uh, Tex-Mex or Mexican food as well as just other food. So, yeah, right. I love growing up in Texas. I'm cool with the heat. Yeah. I can deal with all that. But, yeah, I had a lot of fun growing up. You know, of course, I'm in a different place now. But, yeah, grew up in Texas. And I don't want to dismay, but do you think, I mean, people say the people in Texas are very friendly. Is that true compared to Maine even, right? Yeah, you know what's interesting is, yes, people, <laughs> I think down south tend to be somewhat nice, but sometimes it can even be fake. It's just being cordial. It's, you know, so I don't know, you know, I I, I tend to find people in Maine very nice. I, I, I always say people in Maine are like rugged. They're like right. here for like the gusto. And you can still be nice while doing that, you know. So, yeah, I find people in Maine pretty nice. But down south, people, the way that we're taught to act around each other is to be very thoughtful. There's like a southern politeness that yeah. they're... Versus in Maine, people are like this rugged individualism. I always find it to be like in Maine or New England, because so much of the time you're spent indoors, Yes, uh, they're more kind of into themselves, whereas in, where it's warmer places, people are outside more and interact a lot more often. I definitely think places that have like the long winters and all that, they have you have like more of an insular winter as well, and like the culture reflects that. So yeah, absolutely. And so you came up to, to Maine to go to school. Yeah, to go to Bowdoin in the year 2000. Yeah. I uh, graduated uh, high school in 2000. Shout out Grand Prairie High School. Because, you know, everybody from <laughs> my high school is going to see this. And then, uh, well, we never know. But then um, aside from just graduating and then taking that summer, I took a string of Greyhound buses. I remember that because they had this deal. It was like 100 bucks to go like anywhere in the United States. But it doesn't necessarily mean one bus. So I really took, right. like, I swear it was like 9 to 12 buses all the way up the East Coast. Uh, showed up at uh, Bowdoin College and uh, did the thing, you know. That yeah, uh, just to talk about that, great. I remember that. I always thought of that was the, most, the interesting thing. You could take go across the country, but it's a long journey. You end up in Des Moines over to here in Nebraska. And you got to connect on a lot of buses. See the country, like meet a lot of interesting people, too, on the buses. 100%. Right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So in, at, at Bowdoin, you studied English major, also African Africana studies. Was that what it's called? Africana studies was yeah. my major. major. English was my minor, but basically, okay. you know, yeah. same thing. And uh, like for me, so first English, you know, I grew up uh, in Texas. Like I always had like AP and honors classes, and so I had literature, and I was a pretty good writer. I won some contests when I was young. I've always been a strong writer, and I like words. Right, that gets reflected like in the rapping and the music and stuff we record, as well as writing. But, you know, English for me was something that I really appreciated at Bowdoin. Again, it was my minor, but my major was Africana Studies. And the thing that's interesting about Africana Studies, uh, particularly in a college or uh, at a college that's interdisciplinary, like Bowdoin, where, where it's a um, liberal arts institution, you, you know, I had classes like African-American women's poetry. Right. <laughs> you know, which is about women. It's about poetry. It's about the African-American experience, about yeah. the black experience all wrapped into a single class. Okay. Right, so a lot of what I did in Africana Studies was interdisciplinary and combined multiple disciplines. Did a lot of disciplines all at the same time. Yeah, or at least okay. two or three at a time, things right. like that. Again, it was liberal arts. But yeah, studying what 
sometimes people will say, well, what is African, Af Africana studies? Some colleges or universities, they call it African studies. Because um, it's true to say it's not African-American studies per se, though that might be a part of it. The way I say it is, think of the continent of Africa. Think of her descendants throughout history, all over the world, coming and going. That's what they call the diaspora. Okay. Studying that, the Africa itself, and the reality of the diaspora over hundreds of years, that is what we studied in Africana studies. And that makes sense. I mean, because you don't want to kind of pigeonhole just to African-American studies, let's say, or something like that. I mean, it just, it's so much more historical things going on in culture. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. And of course, there's plenty of African-American um, and, you know, black American things that I have studied, that I continue to study, literally. Um, but yes, Africana studies and learning about the African diaspora is a very, it's quite broad, actually. Yeah. yeah. We were talking before about how you, you were doing music at an early age. You started doing music as a teenager? Man, you know, I would say when I was in elementary school, fifth grade, that's in elementary school in Texas, um, I tried out for the choir and I didn't make it. And as the joke slash story always goes, my teacher, who I really appreciated, uh, he was like, you know, Jerry, you did pretty good, but there's not a place for you in our choir because your voice has already changed. And our, tre our, our, our choir is actually called the treble makers. Yeah. So whether you think that's funny or not, treble, of course, is the high pitched dial in your car, right? It's not the bass part. My voice had already changed to the bass part. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And so he was like, no, no. It's, and he, because I remember he was really trying to be like, don't be too discouraged. Next year in middle school, Jerry, they're going to need you. And dude, starting in sixth grade, all through middle school, and then all the way through high school, I was in the choir. And I was bass section leader the last two years. So, like, I was in the choir singing multiple times per week, going to competitions, all that. I grew up singing. Yeah, because you have a deep voice, and you got that deep voice at an early age. So yeah, you, apparently. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> you aged out quickly of the one choir, but you kept going and singing. Yep. Um, and, yep. and that's, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but you were also, I think, producing music a little bit in those days? Did you? Yeah, so yeah. I like how you asked that. that. That love of music early on, dealing with my voice, but then being in the choir, like learning to collaborate. You know, if you've ever church choir, group of friends for the holidays, there's a certain feeling you get when it's you and like, you know, let's say at least three or four of the people singing together. And if it's even more, you really get this kind of vibe, this kind of rush from creating a sound together, particularly if there's great harmonies. Yeah. But that being said, that that did start to kind of spiral, I think in a good way for me, thinking about being in the choir. I remember I used to stay after school in middle school. Miss uh, Amy Francis was my choir director. Love her to this day because she really believed in me, taught me so much. It's, she was one of the first people to start teaching me uh, like a little bit about composing. Like, like we would sight read music and, and I kind of, you, you know, you might know music but not know how to read it or write it. It's like not exactly the same thing, right? But she would help me like sit down at the piano, maybe translate some ideas. And we used to have these cultural art competitions in school. And I used to, apply, like I used to I put like two pieces of music, three pieces of visual art and like prose and poetry. And I remember there would be years I would win three to five awards. And I started winning stuff for music. Not that it was good. I don't remember what it was, but... When you know, when you're in the sixth grade or seventh grade, being able to just translate an idea on the piano to something, they play it back and go, "Well, dang, that kind of sounds cool." You you might be in the runnings, you know. I'm not I'm not trying to say that I was blowing things out of the water, but I was competing against my peers and I was performing well. And so for me, I think I also had early feedback that like I sounded good being a bass in the choir, and we needed that. I I won some awards that showed like, oh, like you're doing something, and then people dig on it. And I think that really helped propel me. And then I started producing. I would say I started producing seriously when I was like 15. One time we had went to the studio and I thought it was so cool, but I didn't know how to make beats. But I was in choir and I knew something about music. And my cousin let me borrow her keyboard. My cousin Erica let me borrow a keyboard that her dad had gave her before he passed. And I sat down and I remember because you can make four tracks on it. You know, like if you're going to practice playing a song, some keyboards can like play the drums in the background so you know the timing. Well, that takes at least two tracks. Right. I had one where you can record four. It was designed for practicing. I was making beats like a big dog. Right. <laughs> and that's when I realized like, I know how to make beats. What? And also when we used to rap, we didn't have that much or any money. So learning how to start making beats early on made it to where we could try to make songs and stuff. I mean I had other people around me that was good at making beats, but yeah, it all the entrepreneurship, the musical synergizing via collaboration all started for me pretty young and grew. Right. And that's it. Yeah. So Let's talk a little bit more about when you got to Portland. Let's take a quick break. You be able to stick with us for a minute or two? I will. All right. We'll take a break. We'll hear more about when you got to Portland and what you're doing now.
Yes. Okay, awesome. We'll be right back. Connecting the state of Maine's rich black history to black change makers weaving Maine's black future today. That's fire. We must stand in the unapologetic claiming and holding of our worth in every room, every interaction, every stage, every boardroom, every bedroom, all of it. Absolutely. I hear that. Yes. We are the flavor. We are the sauce. We are the soup of the day. We are it. Yeah. And we must always remember that. We're right back here with Genius Black. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more now about, I think, 2005, you moved to Portland, Maine. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. After, you know, graduated with yeah. Bowden and then, and uh, or maybe it took a couple more years. But, you know, around the time I came to Portland, I mean, at the time, I, was, I, I think I was working in sales. Um, and, yeah, actually, I started working at Apple. That's what it was, maybe right before I moved from Brunswick. And I ended up working for Apple Inc. for 12 and a half years. That's so I was there for quite, quite some time. Uh, quite some time. But, you know, I think I would say that underneath, like when I was at Bowdoin, for instance, um, I was always doing music and in the studio, pulling all-nighters and doing school as well. And then when I, you know, after graduating and I came to the Portland area and stuff, I was working, but I was still doing music as well. Sometimes I might get hired to do a couple sessions, maybe sell a beat or something. I, I didn't take it like a, let me stop everything in my life and just make music because you can't, can't often do that. That's not sometimes the balance, right? But um, I was able to keep it going. But yeah, I was working in sales and doing different things and getting to know Portland a little bit. Um, and then over time, you know, working at Apple, I met a lot of people and I just kept getting better with media and music and stuff like that. And I started building up, I would say, kind of a crew. I, yeah. I was calling them my usual suspects. Yeah. I have these people that I make music with. It became regular. It was more regular at certain times. But, um, you know, people that I knew could really do really solid vocal performances. You know, one of the things uh, I'm building up to Jim City. That's right. That's right. That's yeah. Right. That's right. 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 Get to that. Yeah. yeah. And just one of the things that I started to recognize was, you know, some people might hire me to, hey, man, I want to book four hours in a studio so you can record me. Cool. Uh, someone say, hey, man, you know, I need you to make a beat or can I hear all the beats you have? I want to buy some. You know, all those things are one thing. But I started to find that it was cool running sessions sometimes. But honestly, let's be real. A lot of the people who came through to the sessions, I don't really love their music. I'm not even going to judge the music. It just didn't hit me. Right. Uh, okay. But I started to notice there were a couple people that when they came through, uh, even just like, I mean, man, let's just do something. Like, they were dope. Like, they were real good. You know, I mean, if I was to shout out some of the names in particular, people like KF Coast, people like Suzy Assam. Now, there's people who aren't currently in the Gym City crew. We can talk more about that. I mean, people like DJ Matt Perry. Uh, I mean, there's just a couple of, like, characters out here that when we came together, um, Ben Noyes, like, I was just like, we, did we really... You know, you leave a session, you're like, did we really just do that? That's crazy. Like, put it on so we can drive home, listen to it, you know, just so you know that you're excited. Um, and I start to keep track of those people and, like, build relationships with those people. And then after a while, I mean, even when I put out my first album, uh, which is under the Genius Black moniker as an artist, it's called Fa Pharaoh's Recipe. It's pretty proud of Pharaoh's Recipe. And a lot of those su usual suspects appeared on that album. This was before we were, per se, Jim City. I was just, again, bringing in certain people. Right. Running... <laughs> Fewer sessions where people were like, fewer sessions where the person down there around the corner tells me that they want to meet me at five o'clock so I can report them. More sessions where I'm like, no, this beats fire. I wonder what Kev Coast thinks about it. You know what I mean? Like, like that, that became more of what I was doing over a couple of years. And then, um, you know, I, it, I mean, it, it built up, it took, it took a couple of years. But then we got to this place where I started to apply for some grants for a couple of things, got like another camera. So then that's where I had two and some more stuff and backdrops. And I started, I started to focus on making better quality music by getting more gear. And I started making better visuals because in the world of music and entertainment, right. the visuals and the audio go together. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah, like right now there's things going on while we're recording that you've done to take care of the visuals and the audio. And the audio. You know what I mean? So, but this was the genesis of Gem City, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Kind of where it all formed. 
Uh, but at the same time, you were also, was this when you started the black owned main podcast too? Yeah, so around that same the time? Gym City stuff was bubbling a little bit before, but that summer of 2020, to your point, yeah. it really solidified. Like right. the first Gym City album, any of y'all that happens to tour or who want to go listen to it right now, called Gym City by Genius Black, featuring a lot of amazing artists. We made it a lot of that music that summer of 2020, and I kind of felt like we was really hitting on the musical vibes, and there was just a lot of like, I don't know, spiritual vibes, people was protesting the, the the world's energy was shifting in some ways. Yeah. I think we all witnessed that, like it or love it or whatever, that's what was happening. And for me, the music started to really solidify, particularly some of those relationships, so that we can get like Tiny Foot started coming through. We started having these intense songwriting sessions. That's when we wrote like Head Down, for instance. Tiny Foot's one of the artists, shout out, that I work with a lot. And then um, at, in that same flurry of energy was when, you know, this was after the murder of George Floyd, when, um, uh, Rose Barbosa, who is the uh, the uh, founder of the company, we we I was one of the initial founding co-directors with her. She had approached me, and I mean, this is someone I knew for years, and she started to tell me about an idea, like where all her skills came together. She's smart, marketing degree, all this stuff, and she said, "Hey, man, I want to make this. I, I really think that I want to make the first or the only or whatever. I just want to make no. She just wanted to make a direct an online directory of all the black-owned businesses in the state of Maine." And that was her vision. She started telling me about it, and I, then I started getting with her, working on that, and that's we watched well, Black Well, you, you had told me about how, with that, it wasn't always supposed to be about racial justice, but it was an interesting thing because you can't un intertwine that. Yes, a well, lot of times that's a part of it. Because... I would say that it was Black Owned Maine as a vision, by my understanding, based by what, based on what Rose brought to me, and then what we started to build. I would say that it did have to do with racial justice and social justice from the beginning, but the focus was like economic justice. The focus was supporting businesses in particular, like supporting commerce. Yes, black businesses, but to understand that by supporting, like you vote with your dollars. Right. And so even if you feel like, yeah, of course there should be black businesses in Maine and we support that. But if you never spend any money at a black business, then are you actually supporting it or do you just like want to be a supporter, exactly. which are two different things. Um, so yeah, yeah. So yeah, because I mean that is a very important because it's like if, if the if you're not able to be participate in the economy, it's not a lot of justice in that, right? I mean, it's kind right. of but it, it all goes hand in hand, especially in a capitalist system. Exactly. It's like if you're in a communist system, they might give you know everybody equally, but here you know there's all of these things that go into it but i i do know also uh that that kind of spurred into the the newer podcast that you have now uh made black future podcast yes yeah, yeah absolutely and i mean i think part of the question you asked me before yeah. with black owned main as a company one of the things that we started to do one of the programs was the black owned main podcast it only lasted for so long but that was part of what we would do to talk about the message interview a lot of the business people it was pretty great and some people really loved it in more recent years, I was sitting on the vision for a while for something called Maine's Black Future. Maine's Black Future. Okay. Right? And Maine's Black Future is manifested as a podcast uh, produced by myself and the Maine Monitor. And yes, the, 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 you know, the simple way to understand Maine's Black Future is that I start off every episode dipping into the past. Maine's Black history. There are some amazing figures that are black, that have been in Maine for hundreds of years. I highlight them one at a time and tell some of their story. A lot of them are intriguing. They're all engaging that i found so far. And then what I do is I move forward to interviewing and conversing with a black Mainer who's currently influencing culture and life in Maine and therefore weaving the future. Maine's black future is about tying together Maine's black past, its black present, present and then leading into the black future. Yeah, and I know the first episode, right? Alphine, is it Natalie? Alphine, Natalie. Natalie. Yeah. And she kind of holistic wellness coach. Was that pretty interesting? Uh, it was. Or? I really, like, I always enjoyed speaking with Alphine because I've had multiple times to chat with her, sit, you know, see her talk about things she's passionate about in the past. So I, I figured we'd have a good conversation. Right, right, right. You know, I cheated. I picked someone who I, <laughs> I knew could, you know, make right, it right. sound like that. And, uh... We, we did. We had a great conversation. I learned more about Alphine TV. The, the, it's this show she's putting out. She's been filming stuff for quite some time. Um, I learned more about her history, like this, this some of the awards, the way she's been recognized, this grant she got. 
uh, in the past and to help her kind of fund some of the stuff she's doing. So it was cool to like uncover some stuff from her and just like get to know her better. Like I already knew some stuff about her, but that's what happens when you have a conversation, right? Like you learn a little bit more, so right, has to crack right. open. Yeah, you know? exactly. But yeah, no, it was it was really cool. It was positive vibes. I look forward to her launching Alphine TV and continue to support her. For sure. Yeah. And you had uh, Juness. Yeah. What was his last name again? Juness State. Yes. And he's a cinematographer. I've met him. Yeah. He's really talented. cool guy as well. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and then uh, is it third uh, podcast up and coming, right? Is that with uh, uh, Mr. Muhammad? So just real quick, I was going to say yeah. about Juness. Uh, he is a very talented up and coming cinematographer, but he's also a fashion consultant. Fashion consultant. And the reason I bring that out is that one thing that me and Juness, like we both have a lot of talents. He's really talented. Like I, I call him Juness the genius. <laughs> and then I'm genius. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But the thing about it is that we both agree that you shouldn't allow people in your life to somehow convince you that you're only able to execute one type of art. Ah, I remember that, yes. If you really are a vibrational manipulator, if you're really in there, and if you're willing to take time and pick up the learning curves, you can shine in multiple ways. Right. And, and sometimes you've got to snatch that space because people will be like, well, you're a photographer. What do you, what do you mean fashion? But you look at Juness, he be fly. And right. he's the uh, yeah, epitome of he's not having to stay in his lane, quote unquote. He's, he's doing got multiple lanes. Things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know. Well, we'll get June S on here sometime and we can talk to him a little bit as well. Yeah, right. On the that show. would be awesome. But but, yeah, I was ahead. gonna say you talked about Adela Muhammad. Yeah, right. She is the uh founder of Third Place Maine, and I look forward to uh, I'm gonna be sitting down with her soon yeah. and doing an interview. Uh Adela uh, you know, is the founder and helps to lead Third Place Maine, which has a lot to do with they're being comfortable and engaging, networking places all throughout Maine in different sectors for black and brown people, for BIPOC people in the state of Maine. Um, and although Maine is, generally speaking, a friendly state, um, the fact remains that a lot of black and brown people still end up feeling or being alienated in a lot of rooms and places and events and things. And so sometimes by like kind of having your own space makes it easier to exist in general and then to also feel good stepping into some of those other spaces until things continue to mix up better. So, you know, that's my way of saying it. But I really love the work that Adila does. And I actually help lead. Actually, we meet up here at Portland Media Center, um, the BIPOC Media and Communications group, myself and Luke. We, uh, we lead that. So, yeah, definitely making a difference for black and brown people in Maine. But I'm going to have, I look forward to having a great conversation with her and to bring the conversation to y'all. And I made the mistake. I said, Mr. Muhammad, it's Mrs. Muhammad, it's Adela. Uh, Adela. Yes, Adela. 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 Yeah. Uh, so, I, I know you said future guests, you want to have some politicians on. Uh, we talked about that a little bit. Uh, more music artists. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I, I got a couple more episodes this season. I'm, I'm, I'm refraining from telling people exactly who will be what, but yeah. I think there's cool things coming. And yes, I am chatting with uh, at least one really cool politician uh, thinking about another person. We'll see. I just want, I mean, I'm being honest. I want to bring y'all people that you care to see, right? You know, right. that you want to hear from. But I am also thinking a bit about season two and I've been chatting just a little bit with the main monitor about that because they support me in a bunch of ways to, to make this happen. And yeah, I mean, I'm, I've been brainstorming one episode where I can get one to two musical performances in for some local black artists. Because I think getting to know them is one thing, but seeing them in their in their zone, doing their thing is like a different life. So yeah, I've been thinking about just how to bring value and to entertain my, my audience that's growing, you know, and just keep them engaged. And also just keep revealing to them that there's just so much brilliance here that some of us know and we're still discovering. I'll put it that way. Yeah, I mean, Portland still has so much more to discover and there's just not enough great media outlets. It's great that you're doing that. And I know you wanted to give a shout out to a radio station that you work with. Is it WJZP? Absolutely. Shout out WJZP. Uh, there's multiple people, Dennis, Loida, that I work with on the team over there. And, and I, uh, I'm trying to think, there's a couple more people as well yeah. that I've bumped into and that we've chatted. The, the thing about WJZP is that it is an FM terrestrial radio station, meaning that the waves actually go over the land. Not meaning that it's not just like serious radio or you listen on a computer, although you can and should stream it on a computer. You know, having a relationship with folks at an FM radio station that are out here in the community and trying to make a difference is cool because they enjoy Maine's Black Future and they, you know, they, they are in cahoots with me and I'm in cahoots with them. Wow. Um, the thing about WJZP, they they play super dope, jazz, funk music. They spend a lot of time getting some modern shine on black artists who in the 70s and 80s and 90s maybe didn't get the shine that they truly deserve. So shout out WJZP for doing that. 
And keep in mind, it is also the only FM radio station in the state of Maine that is black owned and one of very few in all of New England. So the thing about, you know, WJZP is that it's a um, WJZP is an icon out here. Even, it might not be the biggest radio station in the world, but when you hold that place, you hold a place that it does here. So, yeah, I'm proud to be working with them, getting to know them more. And I honestly figured out other ways that I can work with WJZP to make more impact. impact. Well, I know uh, you also work with the Amjambo newspaper. Is that, is that the right pronunciation? Amjambo. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I mean, so they, uh, they've they printed articles about me a couple times, which I truly appreciate because it's great chatting with folks because uh, they're, I mean, they're, I feel like I always have good conversations and they do a good job writing about my endeavors and, you know, um, they have a lot of um, they have a lot of visitors on their website and a lot of people that check into them because they focus very heavily on the black community, African community, immigrant community. A lot of people in Africa check out Mjambo Africa to like be connected. So, you know, when I get featured in something like Mjambo Africa, there's a lot of eyes on me and communities and, you know, you can there's different people that speak different languages that go there for new news and who might see me that wouldn't normally like that. I wouldn't know how to like say, Hey, this is what I do. Yeah. So I, I appreciate it all. You That's know true. what I'm saying? Yeah. And the other thing about it too, that, that does kind of, I guess, touch me that hits, that strikes me is when I work with the folks at Jumbo Africa, you know, some other organizations too, but you know, that support a lot of the immigrants out here. Sometimes when I'm telling like the story of Pedro Tavuk in Paris, who's highlighted in my second in my second episode of Maine's Black Future. I mean, he was illegally pirated across the ocean when they were no longer supposed to be transporting enslaved people across the ocean. But in a sense, you know, if they hadn't stolen him, I mean, his, he came from Africa. You know what I'm saying? So there's these stories of these different ways that human beings have come across the ocean from Africa to the United States over hundreds of years that I, that I believe are worth dissecting, understanding, and honoring. And I, I think in modern times, the nuances of what happened and why things are the way they are still tend to get overlooked. So I believe in the anti racial aspect of Maine's Black Future, where it's like, let me tell you about the past. I'm also challenging you to rethink the now a little bit. And there's a, I mean, it's a million great stories, and and they can find this podcast on Spotify, I, I you know, Apple, Apple Music, Amazon. but also uh, on the main, the main monitor, monitor too. Yeah. yeah, that's the main place we host it. And right. like I said, they support me to write it. The crew over there helps me edit, just gives me all kinds of ideas. And so, I always send people there. You know what I mean? Because you you can also if you go to the main monitor dot org slash podcast. You can then read about the podcast a little bit more than just hearing the episode. So, you know, it's a good good way to... Uh, yeah, they give you a big overview of it. Yeah. Well, there's a couple more things I just wanted to... While we have you here, uh, just talk about your photography a little bit, too. That's another passion of yours. It's true. So, I'm a renaissance man. I feel okay just jumping out and saying that, you know. No shame uh, here. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe later. I'll be, right, right. Can I say that? No. Um, but, yeah, I am pretty serious about photography. Yeah. And, I, you know, now I've only been at it for a couple of years, uh, two and a half years, two, I don't know, something like that. But, uh, you know, I'd say in the last year or so, so year, year and a half, I got real serious and just started studying more. I got some mentors. Uh, you know, Michael Wilson taught me a bunch of stuff. My, my dude, Colin, taught me some stuff. Uh, my like, multiple people, Juness. Juness, thing uh, definitely was great. Uh, I didn't, didn't do this now. No, yeah. Juness gave like he really challenged me to start studying light and shadows a lot. So I've been supported. Uh, I'm also just a curious person, and when it comes to pro apps and creative endeavors, part of my talent, like how I got the nickname Genius when I was a kid, is that I'm able to absorb those things like real quick. Right. So I've been like at it. You know, and so yeah, I've been able to get hired to do some shoots, and um, yeah. And if we can, right now, we'll take a look at a couple of those photos while we're finishing up the podcast. Yes. We'll, we'll be having those right over the shot right here. If they haven't been already, we may, maybe we've already put them up and you've already been watching them. Uh, but we're also going to see a couple of clips. Uh, but let's finish up by making sure that you tell the audience uh, exactly where they can find you. Yes. Get some plugs out there. Thank you, Louis. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, appreciate y'all for taking the time to check out this interview and just keep supporting us. I think the one of the main places that you can follow my journey and keep up on some of the things happening in my life, my Instagram is called Real Genius Black. R E A L G E N I U S B L A C K. Real Genius Black. That's where I mean you can follow Maine's Black Future stuff promos to see who I'm interviewing. Also, you can learn more about Gym City, Maine, 
our music and art collective. You can, you'll see examples of my photography there. So that's a way to keep an eye. If you want to follow the music stuff, merch, uh, intellectual property creation shows, then you want to follow Jim City, Maine, G-E-M. I know whenever I say Jim, people are like, like, a gym, no, like a gemstone. Or GM, right. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's the I'm, Texas. I'm right? from Texas. Right, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, not that little, little allergies. Gem City. Gem, like, gem. G E M C I T Y M A I N E. Gem City, Maine on Instagram. We'd love for y'all to follow there and subscribe or uh, hit the little, the little bell. And then um, I would just say if you want to know more about Maine's Black Future, you can search it anywhere online, but check out the main monitor. They have a whole bunch of cool articles. I really see the Maine Monitor in the state of Maine as just part of like the truth saying power. They really be telling it and doing a lot of research. So I would say check them out in general, but of course at uh, mainmonitor.org slash podcast, you can check out Maine's Black Future and learn more about Genius Black and the different people that I'm able to interview. Thank you so much, Genius. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yes, Thanks a lot.